The KPTU is the largest industrial affiliate of the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions and it is an affiliate of PSI. My name is Daria Cibrari and I'm the uh, local and regional government uh, officer uh, at, uh, at PSI and I will be co-hosting uh, this uh, uh, launch session together with my colleague uh, Huma Haq, who is a social care organizer at PSI. Again, welcome from wherever you're connecting. And many of you are uh, already very uh, well versed with Zoom webinars, but please let me go through a few technicalities uh, uh, so that we can have a, a positive and hopefully smooth webinar experience uh, today. So as you have uh, certainly noticed, uh, we have a Korean and English interpretation today. So please uh, place yourself uh, in the right channel uh, for the language of your choice by clicking on the globe uh, uh, interpretation icon on your Zoom bar. To the speakers and respondents, I kindly ask to be uh, articulating uh, well and possibly going relatively slowly so that we can have a, a quality interpretation today. The chat is open uh, as of now, so if you want to say hi and connect or share resources on the topic, please uh, uh, do so. We will have the chat open at the beginning of this session, then we will close it during the presentations and the respondents' uh, uh, comments, but then we will reopen it during the question and answer uh, session and uh, at the end uh, of the session. So if you plan to interact with the chat, kindly make sure you have a name that is recognizable uh, with your Zoom uh, screen. You also have the question and answers uh, uh, section and there we invite you to uh, formulate questions that you would like to ask uh, to the panelists and the respondents. Uh, don't hesitate to mention if you want to address a panelist or a respondent in particular. And then uh, my colleague Huma, who will moderate the session uh, on questions and answers, she will pick uh, some of the questions and put, put them forward to um, the speakers. Uh, finally, please be aware that we are recording this uh, video session and we will use uh, some of the videos for didactical uh, purposes and for dissemination purposes at PSI and KPTU. So today's uh, session will be running for about 90 minutes and it is structured as per the agenda that uh, you should have already received in uh, um, uh, the email uh, you got from the registration, but my colleagues are sharing the link to uh, today's agenda again in uh, the chat, so open it up if you want to consult it. But basically, after a few opening remarks from my side, we will hand the floor to the author of the report that we are uh, launching today, and that's Jaehoon Lee, who is the research secretary at uh, KPTU Public uh, Policy Institute for People. We will then have uh, uh, responses uh, by uh, three uh, speakers. Daihe O, oh, chair of the KPTU Seoul Pass branch, and then from Joe Wagner, who is professional officer for aged care, and Megan Corliss, who is director for education, research, and aged care at the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation, which is also an affiliate of PSI. We will then have the pleasure of ge uh, getting uh, closing remarks from uh, the KPTU Director of International Relations, uh, Song Hee Oh, and then uh, a few closing remarks uh, and next steps from my side. So now that we have gone through the practicalities, again, let me uh, welcome, to, uh, this, uh, link, welcome you to this session. And let's uh, release uh, the, the policy brief. Uh, you can now download the policy brief that you can uh, uh, see here in a physical uh, format in my hands. It's uh, being shared in the chat. We actually have uh, both uh, uh, versions, so one in English and one in uh, Korean, although the Korean one is not uh, 
uh, designed. Uh, you can find them on the same uh, page on uh, the PSI um, publication section and you're uh, very welcome to uh, access it. So let me just uh, uh, take a few more minutes before we hand uh, uh, the floor to the author of the report uh, to just put in context and uh, you know, acknowledge the importance of uh, uh, the launch of this uh, policy brief. First of all, uh, we shall remind ourselves that uh, trade unions often fight for the return of uh, uh, privatized services into public ownership and control. And this is what we call remunicipalization, but also insourcing when the workers come back into uh, a direct employment relationship with, uh, for example, local authorities or central government. But we also call this phenomenon deprivatization. And why do they do that? They often do that because they realize fully how important it is that vital public services are run on a public good uh, basis, not for extractive profits, because when uh, you can make a revenue out of a uh, care service, a water service, a uh, health care, uh, refuse collection, energy, you can actually reinvest that revenue in the service either to expand the reach of the service to improve its quality, to lower user fees if there are any, but also to improve the working conditions and up the staffing levels of uh, uh, those uh, who deliver that life-saving services. And this is exactly uh, why this is important. Unions are also a key transformative force in our societies, which also bring about the change institutional uh, under an institutional and a social uh, angle that is needed to create new public services that are to meet collective needs. And this is what we call municipalization, the creation of public services that did not exist before in a certain context. And so today's policy brief tells you exactly the story of uh, the creation of a new public service in uh, care uh, in South Korea. And it also tells you how this has stemmed from the relentless and complex struggle and campaigns that the KPTU union has carried out and continues to defend relentlessly to deprivatize the care sector in South Korea and to create a more accessible, equitable, quality, and fair care system for all the Korean people. So traditionally care in South Korea has been uh, relegated to the realm of the family, of the household, and uh, has been left uh, largely unregulated as the demand for more professional care services has surged. And if you will read in the report, and uh, a brother Jai Hoon will show it to you, up to 90% of the sector has been left in the hands of private providers with the ensuing consequences that stem from it, lack of access for some in rural areas or for those who have very severe uh, needs that therefore cannot uh, 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 make the private provider make a profit on the service. Uh, but also high costs, erratic service, uh, um, a lot of bankruptcies, uh, briberies, etc. But first and foremost, also very poor working conditions uh, for those uh, who deliver this essential service, overwhelmingly women. So we will hear about how the KPTU and its allies have uh, uh, instead managed in a very difficult uh, uh, a political and social environment in, in South Korea for, uh, for trade unions uh, 
to bring about transformative change in this field to the benefit of the society to redress the gender inequalities uh, uh, and, and territorial inequalities between uh, uh, men and women uh, caring uh, in households, uh, but also between rural and urban areas and so and so forth. And they have done so by uh, pushing for localized services whereby workers are directly employed by municipalities or uh, metropolitan areas. And this is indeed very much the case. Largely, care workers tend to be employed by local authorities, either directly in or indirectly. So once again, uh, I, I stop here. I just want to reiterate how important this uh, endeavor that the KPTU continues to uh, defend and advance is. It contributes directly to the work uh, of PSI as a collective trade union movement in public services to advance our collective knowledge and practice of deprivatizing public services and returning them in the realm of uh, the public for the public good. But this work also contributes greatly to the work uh, of PSI in care and notably uh, the implementation of the PSI's uh, care manifesto, whose uh, uh, five points include reclaiming uh, care services uh, in public hands as one of the transformative levers that we can use uh, to make uh, care um, a fair, accessible and gender transformative uh, service. With that, I stop here. I thank you very much for uh, listening to this introduction and it is now my pleasure and an honor to introduce the author of the paper, Brother Jehun Lee, again a research secretary at the KPTU Public Policy Institute for People. And Jehun uh, researches on many topics, including, of course, uh, labor and uh, social and economic relations. And he has uh, uh, got a presentation. Uh, so while he puts uh, uh, that up, please uh, uh, go on and share the screen if you want. I just want to remind you that as of now, the chat is uh, disabled, but you can uh, use the question and answer section to put any question forward to the speakers and we will uh, do our best to pick them up in uh, the uh, debate uh, section of today's agenda. Thank you very much and over to Brother Jehun Lee. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Jehun Lee, the research director. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, we hear you well. Sorry, um, just one second. Thank you. So today I would like to talk a little bit about the municipalization of care service providers in South Korea. And I believe that we had great comments from Ms. Song Yi Oh and uh, Daria. So thank you very much for your feedback. So now I'd like to continue with my presentation. So these are some of the contexts that um, Daria mentioned. In order to fully understand this re uh, report, I think that you do need to understand the context of the international context. There had been a lot of uh, failures of uh, privatization and there were international trends of re-municipalization. And from PSI, there was a report in 2022 on long-term care and there were webinar series as well as the report. And there were two different kinds. Um, I believe that there are similarities in Korea and in order to change 
uh, the private uh, care into a more of uh, government-led care. Uh, PSI is pursuing a lot of these campaigns in order to rebuild the social organization of care. So based on this kind of context, I hope that you can hear my presentation. So these are the contents, four different categories. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of the for-profit care service in Korea. And then afterwards, move on to how the creation of the PASS or the Public Agencies for Social Service came about. And then moving on, what the next steps are for PASS as well as um, the challenges. And then I will conclude with my concluding remarks. First of all, in order to understand the care services um, in Korea, this is from the ILO. On the left-hand side, you see the portion of uh, men and women, the share of total care work in Sweden and Norway. You do not see a large spread, but however, in Korea, women have the lion's share of the care. And on the right-hand side, this is the time spent by men in the various categories of unpaid care work. So this is just for the men. And as you can see, it's, it's 39 minutes. So this is only 39 minutes for men. Similarly, in Southeast Asia, you um, have China and Japan, but even compared to those countries, um, Korea is very low, and that means that a lot of women are taking up the lion's share of the care services work. So based on that, please listen to the presentation. So, based on a patriarchal society, um, there, there was a lot of women who were in charge of the care. However, there ha had been a turning point, the adoption of long-term care insurance, which was implemented in 2008. Until that time, there were a lot of institution-based or non-profit care services um, to a very limited range of low-income households. However, after the adoption of the LTC insurance, it was put into law in April of 2007, and it was implemented on July of 2008. So you see the chart. So you see the recipient or the subscriber. They pay a certain amount of the premium to the National Health Insurance Service. Then the NHIS provides various different services. They also pay the benefit costs uh, to the Long-Term Care Institute, which then provides those services to the recipients. Going into more detail, 67.1% of uh, the costs are borne by the recipient or, or the subscriber, and 32% comes from government subsidies. Out of that, 12.9% is from government subsidies from the, uh, the municipalities, as well as a 19.1% from medical benefits. And overall, if you look at the expenditures, 96.4% is spent for insurance benefits. On the right-hand side, this is a, a breakdown of who is actually the recipient. Based on June 2022, you have around 9,150,000 uh, populations uh, over 65 years. The approval rate for the senior population um, is 87.3% and about 10% is actually, as you have seen, is uh, the aged population to benefit ratio. And now, 
Private uh, providers are the lion's share. 98.7% is providing it. And individuals uh, are making up uh, the biggest portion with 83.9%. Local authorities is very limited with 0.9%. These LTCs um, that are run by individuals in 2010 amounted to around 11,113 facilities, but that doubled to 22,000 um, in 2020. As you can see from the graph itself, you can see that it has increased with an aged population that is increasing rapidly in Korea. You can see that the graph is accelerating at a very fast pace. But these LTCs have a characteristic. They are small scale. These facilities, this is actually a rundown of how many users or recipients there are per facilities. Um, around 69.5% or 70% of these facilities are run in a very small scale with under 10 people. This is uh, the biggest portion with almost 18,000 of these facilities. And on the right-hand side with the purple graph, these are the graph uh, that shows how many actually shut down each year that apply or file for bankruptcy. An accumulated number of for six years shows that 12,182 facilities had filed for bankruptcy and closed during those six years. Of course, new ones open up, but then again, they close every year as well. The problem is then you do not have these beneficiaries get consistent services and you have unstable uh, supply of services. Daria mentioned a couple of international cases, but a lot of challenges also arise. You do operate with some of the public and government funds, but then, then there are some limitations of the private driven care providing structure. There are illegal and underhand operations weak regulations as well as managements. So that's why we have given you a couple of cases here. If you look at one case in point, this was actually done uh, by a survey from the government. Out of the 689 LTC investigations in 2022, 95.4%, almost the majority, were non-compliant practices or detected of non-compliant practices. And that it amounts to around 30 billion won. And out of these long-term care facilities, if you, um, if you expand the scope of these facilities, because 689 cases were only 2.6% of them, then you will have even more cases. So you can see how the overall um, the overall situation is quite dire. So the in-home or elderly care service workers are mostly contract and hourly based workers and on the right-hand side, you also have to have the certification of those workers. This graph shows the number of people who have actually uh, received the, the certifications. However, the purple graph also shows the people who are active So you see the number of people who have actually attained, obtained the certifications, but only a portion of them are actually active as care providers or care, as or, or care workers. 
because of the overall situation and the working conditions are so dire, not a lot of them are actually working. So this actually shows the stark condition of uh, the care workers in, in Korea. That's why um, the overall working conditions are dire, then you don't have many workers working in the field, then that leads to the deterioration of the service itself. It's a vicious cycle. In 2019, we started a pilot project in Korea. And we had the 14 PASS um, that were established in the 14 metropolitan cities nationwide. And in 2021, Chungbuk and Busan, which were a little bit belated, um, two more were established. So apart from the Gyeongbuk, which you can see in green, we have been able to provide these PASS services from the municipalities. So I believe that this is a big step and uh, historically a big step and a turning point for um, the social care and social service. So now um, moving on to explaining more about the PASS or PASS. So PASS is actually looking at a combination of the central and local governments uh, and combining their budget, as well as the NHIS. Of course, they provide that, but to the public, apart from the funds that are provided to the public, um, we do place a lot of focus on the fact that we do have a budget from the central and local government. So we also look into the public care facilities and public child care facilities, as well as other care service related businesses and projects. And with the pass that has been established, this can be kind of like a headquarters for all of these care-related facilities. And while these municipalities operate these service centers, then they can actually employ the workers that work for these facilities. In total, you have 419. This is actually from last year, so I think that there will be an update or an increase. For public child care centers, you have about 1,292. CHCCs is kind of like um, the emergency care uh, providers as well as the home care uh, providers. And this also uh, comprehensively provides care service for uh, the disabled as well. So we have 4,118 care workers directly employed in the 14 past facilities. There had been a lot of challenges because of unstable working conditions. But I believe that Having the working conditions set out for these workers and providing them with stability will be able to create a virtuous cycle for better service as well as uh, the overall stability of care. That is why uh, we have around 53% full-time workers and we have a monthly salary system for in-home care workers in some of the past facilities. Now, um, the significance of the past is that, as I mentioned, care service is something that should be taken care of by the government as well as the society. But the go government had not been doing so. It had not stepped up. It was borne by the individuals as well as the families. 
So it's actually strengthening the public control and social value of the care services. Another part of this is that the care work and labor itself is had been a gray area where a lot of the workers were disregarded and um, they were not active because of the working conditions. We were able to transform the quality of the care work because we were able to focus more on these workers. And then we can also provide integrated care services that are of better quality because of some of those areas that I mentioned before. And I mentioned almost 99% are uh, private facilities. But with remunicipalization, I believe that this will create a positive ripple effect on the care market. For example, there are some areas that private facilities will want to evade, but for public services, I think that it is an area that, um, that can cover all of uh, the services that need to be uh, supported. So I believe that these are some of the significant um, areas that uh, pass bears. The graphs that you see is a survey that we conducted for the service quality satisfaction and the perceived impact of pass on community care. Of course, this is an internal survey, but I'm sure that actual users or benefactors have a much better satisfaction. And you can see that the graph is quite high for a satisfaction on whether or not this is better than the private services. Actual subscribers and benefactors have a high level of satisfaction rates. So, in order for, to create these, pa the, these past facilities, there were a lot of efforts put in by um, various actors. There were a lot of oppositions, and we had to stand up to that, those oppositions to institutionalize PASS. So these are some of the photos that uh, show, showcase our activities. Some of the campaigns, our press conferences. We actually started with four in 2019, and we're still taking baby steps. We do have a lot of ways to go and challenges to overcome. And I believe that there is a lot of uh, oppression as well as uh, responses. There's a lot of places with municipalities. If the heads of the municipalities, if they, uh, if another conservative party takes office, then they have a lot of impetus to downsize uh, the sector or the budgets. So, initially, we should have had uh, the completion of the past project uh, by this year. However, there was a lot of opposition and there were delays because of certain issues in the municipalities. So that is why uh, we're seeing certain uh, areas and municipalities come online a little bit later. This is the conclusion because we do have certain milestones that we still need to reach. I think that um, there are some significant tasks and challenges for us remaining in the future. As I mentioned, 
we still need a lot of financial support from the country, uh, from the nation, as well as the municipalities. Unless the central government provides a budget, the municipalities uh, support will be meaningless and it will be quite meager. Because the, each of the municipalities have their own level of budget and which is all quite different, the central government definitely needs to stand up and then the municipalities will chip in. I believe also that the public infrastructure needs to be supported. For example, for even with child care support centers, for public child care support centers, there are certain problems in which it's a public facility, but it is run by a private entity. So I think that for those cases, it should be maintained as a standard, as a rule of law that for public child care facilities, it should not be relayed over to a private facility or private center for the operation, but to be handed over to pass. The service handling is actually done by the municipalities and not by the larger metropolitan cities. So I believe that we do need to support more than one or two extra pass centers. So I think we also need to expand uh, the level of uh, full-time workers as well in order to enhance uh, the quality of care. So these were also uh, areas in which uh, the operation itself were outsourced to private entities or private organizations. This also should be handled by PASS so that it should be run by a public facility. And lastly, we also should establish a democratic governance. I think that I am also running out of time, but the public care facility itself should also be operated in a democratic manner. Either Seoul or Incheon also have a couple of areas, but this is not um, generic. And so I believe that we do need to appoint the workers' representatives to the board of directors to become much more of a democratic governance structure. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, brother uh, Jae-hoon Lee, for this thorough uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, everyone uh, who has uh, followed uh, your detailed uh, uh, relation, relate uh, of the paper, uh, has got really the heart of it uh, with a lot of uh, extra analysis. It is fascinating. And I think that uh, uh, some of the things Brother Jehun uh, pointed out are particularly telling. First of all, just the pictures uh, of the struggles that uh, uh, the KPTU has put up to uh, bring uh, pass into existence and to defend it and to continue to defend it are really important to understand. Uh, institutions and services do not just spring up like mushrooms in the forest. They are really the result of uh, fights, transformation, social and collective action. And I think we all need to be reminded of that by this uh, exemplary struggle. And second, I also want to pick up on his conclusions on the need to make our public services democratic. And uh, democratic ownership of public services 
means to ensure that there is inclusive, meaningful inclusion of users and community representatives, but also of workers. Workers' uh, democracy at the service uh, uh, workplace is absolutely key because it is uh, workers who hold uh, the absolute, uh, absolutely precious knowledge of how the service can be organized and delivered best. So with those two points, I would like to really thank again uh, thoroughly uh, Brother Jehun Lee for this uh, amazing effort, for this uh, excellent uh, brief. Congratulations, uh, and we will disseminate it uh, widely. And with that, I would like to hand uh, over the moderation of the seminar to my colleague uh, Huma Haq, uh, who will now introduce uh, uh, to you the respondents. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Daria, for handing over. As she said, my name is Hummer, and I am responsible for social care services here at Public Services International. You know, and as Daria kind of set out in her introduction, you know, all of us here know that care services around the world are in crisis. The pandemic really highlighted kind of how vital these services are to our societies and to our economies, and kind of how undervalued and underpaid care workers are. You know, they're forced to work in kind of quite um, long hours in increasingly, you know, insecure conditions. And for too long, the privatization of care has put extracting profits ahead of the care needs of vulnerable people. It unfortunately treats service users not as people with complex care needs, but as potential centers for revenue or profit. Um, and we've all seen examples where, you know, private care workers, you know, they're not treating care workers with the respect that they deserve. You know, they're under, they're undercutting their wages, they're, you know, not training people, they're, you know, cutting staffing levels. And why is this kind of situation arising? You know, what's the kind of global picture that we've seen? And, you know, one of the key reasons why we think this is happening is because of the kind of austerity politics that's been um, enacted across much of the world. Unfortunately, with the different economic crises that seem to be spiraling out globally, governments kind of across the world, they're searching for different ways to save money um, and to meet kind of the growing demand of care. And this has tended to move away from a concept of universal access to kind of high quality care uh, and instead towards kind of the, pub, the private provision of care. Where does this kind of leave workers within this system? Um, unfortunately, it leaves them in an increasingly desperate situation. They're facing huge amounts of pressure to provide care to even more people, uh, but without any increase in kind of funding or staffing or support. So as we all know, care is an incredibly vital service. You know, as we heard in the presentation before, you know, whether it's delivered through public, private or not for profit, they are mostly funded by the public. So we all here, all of us, have a right to know how this money is spent. We need kind of greater transparency um, about how this money is spent and whether it's being spent on kind of providing quality care to service users, being spent on making sure workers are paid properly, or whether it's being spent on kind of, you know, uh, lining the pockets of shareholders, giving bonuses to management. Here at PSI, we're kind of campaigning and organizing for well-funded quality public care systems, which are provided by well-trained, well-paid and well-supported staff. We believe that ac organized and active workers represented by national trade unions, such as what we've heard from our colleagues in KPTU, are the only way to ensure that care workers can fight the precarity and financialization that has become endemic in many care systems around the world. Um, you know, as Daria mentioned, we will continue kind of working with our affiliates within care to build this worker power, to secure collective bargaining and to expand trade union rights and decent working conditions. Um, as we'll be hearing later, you know, a lot of our unions also work to influence their governments uh, and politically kind of advocate on behalf of their members. Uh, at PSI, we are kind of here to make sure that our affiliates have as much support as possible to achieve this. Uh, now I'll hand over to our first respondent, Dei He O, oh, who is the chair of KPTU Seoul Pass branch. Um, and this is the branch which is fighting for the public care for all rather than profit for the few. Uh, Dei He, I will hand over to you now. Thank you.
Can you hear me well? 네, 네. 네, 저는 어, 소수의 이웃보다 모두를 위한 공공재원을 위해 Okay, uh, nice to meet you. I am uh, Daeho, who is fighting for the uh, public service and not only for the uh, private profit. So first of all, as uh, so we could hear the presentation from uh, Daeho, we have so passed. It was our hope. However, now we are facing a crisis um, for its role, so we are fighting for it. So I'd like to share our current status a bit. So, Seoul, like um, city, like uh, has transformed their like care service. So they created a path in order to uh, uh, make the public service as a like public service, which was like previously focusing on the private sector, who is like pursuing like only profits. So there are a lot of like campaigns in like the supporting for the uh, handicaps or the others. So also we had the same target to improve the working condition for the care service workers. So like for the private sector, so the workers working on the very poor environment, like the hourly base or the daily base and very poor service. So we like to like improve the condition in order to provide a stable working condition for the care service workers. So for the past, so we assign work for the like municipal like care service centers and they can indirectly indirectly hire the workers. So also we are like supporting the planning for the care service in connection with the local governments. And also we compare the local initiatives and campaigns in order to provide the care service. So in sum, we would like to improve the um, expertise and the transparency of the public service of the care service while like turning in, uh, like while well, bringing it back from the private service. So uh, currently the sole pass like it actually are operated by the private sectors. So that's why the soul pass is so precious and valuable. So we have the 12 centers and two daycare centers and seven uh, like um, children centers under the soul pass that providing service for the soul citizens. So like there are we can like fill the gap of the uh, care service that the private sectors are hesitant to like go into it. And also, we are providing the st stable service to the users by uh, providing the proper like wage and salaries to the care service. And actually, uh, our sole pass service was more valuable during the crisis. Like we had a like COVID nineteen pandemic. So sole pass like has operated a service for a two hour and a half like years for um for three hundred users. And we provide emergency service to the soul citizens, like and we pr pr like we try our best in order to maintain the normal life of soul citizens because we face an unexpected like outbreak of the COVID nineteen pandemic so because we did not have any response system for the vulnerable like class of the society. So we had a like common vision for the social like um citizens and the vulnerable class. So we provided emergency care service and it was the first like case that we have for the vulnerable class in the society. This could be realized because we had a sole pass system. However, currently we are doing the same effort in order to fill the gap for the care service. However, we are uh, having less and less budget from the Seoul city. Last like, November 23rd, like we could get the announcement from the press that this whole city will reduce the budget for us. So we could check the details of this like a budget cut through various channels. But actually we were providing service for the Seoul citizens. And also we could like have the awareness among the Seoul citizens that the uh, public care service is essential for their life. So this news was pretty shocking for everyone. Because we could, uh, we had like seventy percent cut for our budget. The seventy percent actually um put our uh, put ourselves in danger of its existence. 
So like we have to turn our service into private sectors and also we can fill the gap of the public service so the vulnerable class can now like maintain their stable life or normal life. So I'd like to see why the budget has been cut or reduced. So like based on the articles and the announcement or the mining from the public. So um, the Seoul city like decided the uh, budget cut because they need to review because we are highly relying on the Seoul cities and actually um, the, we are not ideal type for the public care center or like we have very low level of asset, work ethic. And also the last point that their idea is that the care service for the private sector and we are actually rather making uh, the public care service rather be more inefficient. So with all these reasons, so um, so local governments are actually destroying our value of existence. So because we are using more budget compared to the private sectors, that's why they tried to cut the budget for our solar path system. However, we would like to uh, deliver some messages to the Seoul uh, local government as well as the decision makers. Like we have a co-project with the uh, private sectors and also we have a very complementary system for the private sectors because the current like private system cannot guarantee the uh, good working condition for the workers. So this is the minimum like we can have to like maintain the stable working condition for the public service. So with this, we try our best in order to provide like quality service. So this stability and the safety of the service cannot be measured in figures. So what we need to like be aware that we are paying like monthly salary to the public care service workers. And actually hourly wage and monthly wage has a big difference. Because the um, care service workers are doing more than just providing care. Of course, like providing care service, their main job. However, they also like put more efforts in other extra hours, like for commuting or the consultation for the therapy or the treatments, or they also need to do some administrative work. It is also included in the uh, care service works and also it is really important to improve the um, quality of the service. However, based on the previous private system, which is a, like hourly based voucher service, they cannot get well paid or the properly paid, however, they, however hard they work. Therefore, currently, the new like uh, system of these so local governments will lead to the poor working environment and the improper wage. So that's why we have very um, aged women workers for these sectors. So we need to recognize the um, dignity of the care service workers, but the it is not realized. So we think that this whole city of uh, local government is neglecting its responsibilities while blaming us that we are taking a lot of budget from them. So this actually shows that they have very poor understanding of our service. So actually, we there's no angel who just want to sacrifice themselves to provide their service without getting paid or without getting like recognized properly. We need to care of worker too. So all the critics, uh, like blames and criticism on the workers actually suggest that we will have poorer working conditions for the public care centers. So lastly, if the assault pass is demolished, we need to worry about the gap of the uh, care service of public because they will focus, the Seoul city will focus on the rich and good users for the potential customers or the users of their service. So this is one that the public sector tried to address from the private care service. 
So we need to take care about the people who are vulnerable or who cannot, or who doesn't have an access to the service cares. If they like block or like shut down the so pass, I have huge concern. Like where do they have to go when they need the service? I believe the Seoul citizens will be the one who will take all the liabilities after the um, shutting down the Seoul pass. So if Seoul city government like insist to restructure the Seoul city pass, I believe that we will demolish the right and the dignity of the human beings again. The care service is the sector for the public sector, not for the private sectors, and also the service provided by the human beings. That's why we have to invest in people. So we cannot blame like care service workers as they're the thief of the budget of the city. It is actually the betrayal of their work. So actually these can occur the disaster for the care service. So we will not forget this trial of the city government. And we will ask for the responsi responsibility of this trial, this budget cut, and we'll fight until the end. So this is the end of my respondents. I'd like to share some pictures of our like campaign and activities. So this is the uh, picture that we uh, when we had a demonstration on uh, front of the city hall when we heard the announcement that our budget has been cut. Uh, this is also uh, when we had a press conference when we heard the news that our budget has been cut by like seventy percent. And also uh, every month we are doing the candle campaign every month in order to improve the awareness. Also we do the street rally in order to raise our voice. And here you can see the uh, picture when we had a press conference at the secondary campaign in order to normalize the operation of this old pass. So with this, I'd like to conclude my presentation and my response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dehu. That was amazing. Thank you so much for setting out kind of the work that you're doing and you know it's really important to see that unions aren't just advocating for the rights of care workers but we're also advocating for better quality care systems you know i think we have a really important role in kind of being involved in those conversations with governments so it's really interesting to see the work that you're doing um you know fighting for a proper budget for care services um and those pictures are great it's great to see kind of union in action um, and thank you so much for sharing those with us now, for uh, our next respondent, we will be handing over to our colleagues from the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation from the South Australia branch. First up, we have Jo Wagner, who's the Professional Officer for Aged Care, and she's joined with Megan Corliss, who's the Director of Education Research and Aged Care. We're very grateful for, to them for joining us because I know it's quite late there in Australia. Um, so we're incredibly grateful to have you here. They're going to be talking about the work that they're doing within aged care within South Australia. And they represent, you know, nursing, midwives and kind of care workers across the branch. Um, so please, I will hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Kuma. I'll just get up the screen with a presentation. Um, so just to first say a little bit, thank you so much for inviting Megan and I to present today and, and hopefully we can offer some useful information. Um, we do work for the ANMFSA branch, but it's really important to note that um, the ANMF South Australian branch is part of the ANMF um, nationally and there's 330,000 plus members um, and we're the largest union in, South, in, in Australia. In the SA branch, we're the professional industrial organisation representing 23,000 nurses, midwives and personal care assistants. And we have been the leading voice for nurses, midwives and carers um, for over a century. We do negotiate positive outcomes for our members at local, state and federal levels. And um, in the SA branch, we also own and operate um, the Australian Nursing Midwifery Education Centre, which is a registered training organisation and have our own union legal. 
Um, and I've also established a charitable foundation, the Rosemary Bryant Foundation. And Megan is actually the director of AMAC and the Rosemary Bryant Foundation. So in Australia, um, our aid, just giving you a bit of an overview of aged care, we have three levels of government. We've got federal, state and local government. And our aged care sector is funded and legislated by the federal government. Our aged care services are delivered by a mix of for-profit, not-for-profit and government-owned providers. And the types of aged care services um, the federal government funds are for care in the home, um, residential aged care and, um, and short-term care. I hadn't put up there, but I just wanted to add that um, we have regulation of our aged care industry as well, and that's overseen by the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. And our workforce is also um, in aged care is made up of registered nurses, enrolled nurses and personal care workers. And there's probably a, um, about a 25% um, nursing ratio to probably 75% personal care worker ratio. The, the really um, probably like everyone has said, there has there is still a crisis in aged care. And what we're seeing here in Australia is that ageing population. We've got a significant increase in the number of people um, aged over 85. And with that, we're seeing that increased frailty, you know, uh, multiple comorbidities, um, polypharmacy. We've had um, constant change over a number of years with the shifts in government policy uh, through successive governments. Um, and we've had inadequate and substandard care, neglect, um, chronic understaffing, and that's certainly been exacerbated by COVID. Um, there's been a lack of transparency with funding. So um, where, where with the providers, where is that money going? Um, there hasn't been transparency around that. That's already been mentioned as well. And it has been actually difficult to attract um, public support due to the stereotyping of the sector with all the negative um, media around it as well. I'm going to hand over to Megan now because I think this is the bit you'll be really interested in. <laughs> So thank you, uh, Jo, who's given a, a has given a great overview of um, aged care and the tension really that drove a lot of our campaigns was the, the increasing complexity of need of older people in Australia so that people are getting very old here um, and so they're, they're requiring a lot more care, but then we've got a very thin workforce. So we have uh, our work, uh, the number of people working in the sector is, is getting smaller and smaller and a lot of them are getting older. So we've got this tension uh, within the sector. Um, just initially, um, we just wanted to highlight one of the things that had happened in Australia. We've had a number of campaigns, aged care campaigns. We've had a, a number of changes of government or certainly our governments are only in place for um, three, year, three years. So, yeah, they um, we, that requires us to go out and campaign each time we, we go into a, um, a new cycle. So what we wanted to highlight, though, I think where our success has come has been in the number of campaigns and building within those campaigns. So the union itself has been able to learn from each of the campaigns and um, be able to use those learnings to, um, uh, I suppose, to advise the next campaign as we go through. And the 2022 campaign last year was a very successful campaign with a change of government and the new government is very, um, really sympathetic to the aged care sector and, in fact, made aged care one of its major um, uh, political strategies, including our Prime Minister now actually spoke about aged care was the first thing he, he spoke about prior to, to when he was putting up all of his policies. So it was, it was very um, uh, uh, useful. I've just added there the 2018 Royal Commission into Aged Care. So this was really useful for us too. Um, the Royal Commission is like a public inquiry. Um, it was called by the previous Liberal government and what it gave us was a significant springboard in order, really helpful for the union to get a bunch of recommendations about um, aged care, which related to uh, the workforce and the, the poor care. So we were able to use all of those recommendations in our um, campaign. 
So the actual campaign itself, which was held last year, brought the, the whole of the union together. We, as Joe said before, we have at three levels of government. We, uh, our, Joe and I sit within the South Australian part of um, the union, but at a federal level, there is our federal office. And uh, we adopted a very strong federal approach and it was really well organised and planned at a national level. And we think that that really contributed well to our actual campaigning and our campaign success. But each state branch picked up um, some of the, um, I suppose, that the, the, those sort of bigger um, recommendations from the federal branch and then utilised them at a local level. Um, we one of the other things which I think was very important um, to the um, union was that we drew on previous research. So the ANMF actually in 2016 um, with a, a couple of universities actually did a very large piece of research. It was very deep right down at a very um, low level, which meant that we... Um, we were able to, that research really legitimised our position on safe staffing. It went out and we really knew, so it was no longer sort of anecdotal say-so information. It was actually evidence which we've used right up until our 2022 campaign. So we were able to draw on that, that information. We also invited all our politicians from all the individual um, uh, seats to sign up and declare their party position. This was quite a big job because um, there's a you know large number. So in each seat there would be there could be a possibility we've got a growing number of independents with our major parties. So that meant that we had quite high numbers of um, of people to bring in. But those election commitments also gave us uh, I suppose a benchmark where we could um, go out to the public and to our members and actually report back a sort of a traffic light report card. And I've got that later. So we were actually, rather than saying vote for a particular party, we were able to actually say, these are the people who have signed up and are supporting our actual campaign. So it was a quite an important piece in there. And you just see in this picture up here, this is um, a, a whole lot of our members with our secretary, but this here is actually now our new prime minister who was in Adelaide at that time. Um, in, so 2022 campaign uh, was the federal office, we had a marginal seat campaign. So in South Australia, we had one marginal seat, which was um, uh, Boothby. We put a lot of work into that seat. We targeted voters quite heavily in that seat, including it, it was very uh, resource intensive, you know, literally knocking on doors. We had organisers from the union out doing that work. We were letterbox dropping. We were in that region. So this area here is actually in Boothby. Um, and uh, it, that was very successful. We actually won the Boothby seat. What in Australia, there was a number of, of marginal seats and we calculated that if we could actually win those seats and not too many other seats were lost, that would actually change the government for us. Um, we also obviously had a big media campaign. And one of the things that we did do, which we hadn't done so well before, is the use of digital and social media, which allowed us to get to a, a different target population than those people when you're just door knocking and that sort of thing. Uh, so really quickly, just over here on this side, this is the sort of how to vote card that we had in all of our actual in our um, uh, seats. And it allowed us to sort of show people that, you know, if you vote these other parties, that will give you these key actions. Um, and for us, the key actions, whilst we, we would have a similar view on privatisation, we actually were far broader in our, um, in our uh, campaign to be looking at the quality of care, really, and the associated workforce issues related to that. So we were looking at a registered nurse uh, 24 hours a day because we believe that they needed that increased access to clinical care, the older people did, safe minimum staffing levels. So we were finding some organisations were running way below um, safe levels. Um, so we wanted the right numbers of staff to care. As Joe mentioned before, and I think Huma said as well, transparency and accountability of funding. 
Um, one of the interesting things in Australia is aged care is funded at a federal level and the, the general public don't really understand that because they're more in contact with the state level of um, government. So that understanding that that money travels a, a reasonable distance to get into the, the pockets of our workers. So that transparency is really important to this next um, point, which is improving the wages to our aged care workers. And I, I think one of the other speakers mentioned um, wages and certainly in Australia our aged care workers were being paid below the living wage and recently that has just been increased by our new Prime Minister so that's been a fantastic outcome for the unions here. Um, so in finishing I know I'm talking a lot um, very quickly and it was a it was a big campaign but just in conclusion what I would say is that sustained period of campaigning by the union I'm relatively new to the union um, but I know there's a colleague online at the moment and she's been involved over a longer period so all of that sustained campaigning I think has had done a lot of good to influence people and achieve outcomes in an environment where in Australia people don't care a lot about their old people. So trying to raise that awareness was really important. The evidence basis, and I think we will do a lot more of that because that really legitimised what we were doing. Uh, the ongoing member communication, I think that was a, an area that probably we, we had dropped off several times and it was a real learning that we need to keep sustaining um, that communication to our members so they know where we're, we're having wins and things like that. Given the aged care, similar to other places, is disseminated across a lot of different organisations, whereas our health sector has just got SA Health and a few public or private hospitals. Um, and just in finishing, even though we do have a, a, a new government who is sympathetic to the cause, they're supporting a lot of um, certainly our, our key demands, we still have to lobby and we still have to be vigilant because there's still a lot of work to be done and we have to hold the federal government to be accountable. Um, even at the moment, you know, in Australia, they're promoting submarines and all sorts of things that are very costly, but the aged care sector needs some of that money too in order to do some of this work. So um, that is all, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for both of you for joining us. And I think it's really interesting to hear and, you know, it's particularly around the political campaigning work you did. We all saw last year with the change of government in Australia and the kind of commitments they made to aged care and also the work that you're doing on safe staffing. You know, obviously PSI will represent care workers globally and care systems of care are so different and so diverse. But one thing all our affiliates say is that there's a lack of staff to provide services mm. and that's a key thread that's coming through globally so it's really interesting to hear the work that you're doing so thank you so much for joining us um now we're going to head over to a quick q a um we have some questions in the chat but please um if you have any questions please put them in the q a box we will have a chance to kind of answer them i believe that we have um i know this meeting was due to end at 10 well 10 30 my time I have no idea what time it is where everyone else is, um, but it was due to end within 10 minutes, but we have a bit more time, uh, perhaps another 15, 20 minutes if people are able to stay a bit longer. Um, but yes, so quick go at the Q&A. So we have a first question um, is from Eric Beadit, and the question is for... Um, it's in Korea. What about nonprofits or limited profits like co cooperatives that play in many contexts a major role in care service provision? How do you consider such agents in the Korean context, both in terms of quality of care service for users and working conditions for workers? So this question is asking about the role of cooperatives um, and nonprofit organizations in delivery of care services in Korea. Is there someone, Jaehun, Dehi, is there one of you who would like to take that question? Jaehun? Thank you for the good question. And also it is controversial as well. So the um, non-profits or limited profits like cooperative, so I believe that we have very like different situations globally, but in case of Korea, as I like uh, scripted uh, describing the um first part of my paper. So 
So the um, non-profit like company is actually providing the um, care service to the public. However, although they're non-profit, they had a lot of like um, illegal challenges like fraud, like a non-democratic like barbary. So they had a lot of problems in size. So in order to like strengthening the um, stability with the safety, so we cannot guarantee the um, service, uh, the quality of service, like for um, although it is a non-profit group. So like we can refer to the French case because they also have a non-profit um, organization, but they have a lot of challenges, but we are actually in a worse like situation. So that's why uh, we have to strengthen the responsibility of the uh, country. So I believe the non-profit um, organization is not a like alternative, like the solution for the current situation because non-profit organizations or the cooperatives are actually similar to the uh, private sectors. They have very low quality service. Great, thank you so much. Um, actually, that's a really interesting question. And Joe and Megan, you mentioned that in Australia, there's um, non-profit actors within the care space. I would be really interested to hear about kind of what kind of the situation is for kind of service users and the working conditions for workers within those institutions. Yeah, the, so the, the, um, the not-for-profit sector in Australia at one stage, certainly in South Australia, they dominated the, um, so not-for-profit dominated our, um, our landscape. That is changing quite dramatically with very large organisations. And in fact, there's a huge uh, uh, not-for-profit organisation that's swallowing up the for-profits. And we're seeing the behaviours are becoming very similar because, of course, not-for-profit actually you have to make profit anyway i'm no economist but you have to make profit in order to survive so i think they're behaving in very similar ways however they did grow out of the charitable religious sector so um, they do have some good value sets around some of the their um the way they deliver care however i think at the moment they pretty much all look very similar yeah. because of the lack of workforce and that sort of thing yeah would you agree? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting to hear and particularly interesting that even though these um, organisations have a set of values that, you know, perhaps the situation and the systems are kind of built that they're having to act in maybe ways that don't align with those values. Mm -hmm. And so that's yeah, really absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we have another question um, from Matthew Egan. I think this is one for you, Dehi. Um, and this question is, what way can, oh, sorry, no. Um, we can see that the private sector currently dom dominates the sector within Korea, but what are your hopes for how much of the sector um, past can control in South Korea in the future? So here is that is that one for you? I can read it again if that makes sense. So um, yes. So about you know how um, you know what your hopes are for the sector of pass and you know how much control it can have in the future within South Korea. You talked about kind of the challenges, um, but kind of what are your hopes for the future of the system? The yeah. uh, 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 yeah, as you just mentioned, so it's a matter of the manpower. So actually our goal as a Seoul Pass is to cover all 25 GU as a district in Seoul. However, we only have 12 centers in Seoul. So each GU, each district are providing their service for as residents. However, the problem is so we have two different districts, Noon district and Songdong district. And actually we integrated and removed them. So for the users who are in need of the service in Noon district, they have now limited access to the service. So my hope is we have like different districts in Seoul. It should be expanded to every district in Seoul. However, the currently, like you're actually removing the scale of this service and not hiring enough manpower. I has been hired like three years ago, but there was no additional employment after that. So while we need more service and we need to provide more service, but we cannot expand our manpower. So this is the real situation in Korea. 
해서 간단하게 말씀드리면 So I like to add more comment on his day host like um response like of course we are very like I'm um, struggling and also we are really like be delay uh, behind our goal but we have uh, like a clear direction we have to strengthen and expand our service so like currently like we are like um 90 percent of the coverage from the private sectors so we need to uh plan how to cover at least 30 percent of the public sector by the public sector so we need to review the private organizations and if they have a pro uh, problems we have to remove them actively so with the uh, political movement so actually private organizations are providing their service so they should be under the uh, review and the uh, regulation of the public um regulators so our first goal is to cover 30 percent of the care service as a sole pass Right. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, it's about, you know, wanting to provide those services, but making sure that we have the right staffing levels to provide good quality services. Um, our next question is for Joe um, and Megan. It's from Cyril Dutch from France. Um, the issue of safe staffing, transparency and accountability of public funding are really important. Can you tell more or send you any publications you might have done? about your work on safe minimum staffing levels because um, colleagues and comrades in Europe are very interested in your work um, and also the situation in Korea and the problems um, that are everywhere around the world. So basically more, if you have any more information about the campaigns that you run on kind of safe staffing, because as I mentioned, I think it's a problem that um, lots of our affiliates are facing. Yeah, and the, the publication that we uh, have uh, that, that I referred to, that is, that's a public document. So we absolutely, if you can give us, uh, we can send it through to um, Tom or whoever we work through and then he can distribute that. And we'd absolutely love to do that. And there are a couple of other organisations here that have done work around um, uh, tax reform within the sector as well and so that might be a really interesting around um, some of the, uh, the, the and it's interesting because some of the um, not-for-profit organisations may have been involved in some tax avoidance similar to some of our for-profits so we can send some of those things through as well yeah yeah very happy to do that great Thank you. That's amazing. Um, we have another question that's come through. Um, what sort of non-compliant employment practices are care workers in South Korea regularly subjected to? Do you have a particularly big problem with care workers being paid below the minimum wage? So, you know, you know, is there a lack of enforcement from government? Is there an issue with kind of underpaying of care workers, uh, particularly below the minimum wage? So if Jaehun, yeah, please come in. 우리 국장님 잘 하실 것 같은데 좀 간단하게 말씀을 드리면. So in a nutshell, so care worker problem is quite like similar not only in Korea but with other countries too. For example, so not only the care service, we have to take care of the errands like domestic works. So the uh, non-compliance works, like which is not their responsibility, should be covered by the uh, care service workers. And also, the um, we need to take care of the users, like the people who are in need, monitoring. So actually, we need to guarantee the minimum wage. However, in real world, we are it is not like fulfilled. Also in Korea, like the workers are actually taking their work, like service as a full-time job, like their vocation. However, uh, they are working based on the hourly uh, wage. So their like monthly uh, salary or monthly, uh, monthly income is very limited, which is really low. Although like their system is based on the uh, minimal wage, however, they are working on hourly, hourly rates. So this should be improved or dissolved. So like um, they are working based on the hourly rate and it's just really low. 
So we have a labor like standards, but they are actually violating the regulations a lot. So they cannot have enough break time or the minimum working time, like 52 hours a week, but they are working more than that. Because they're working like based on the hourly rate, right? they have to work like longer in order to have like enough like salary. So they are so the um organizations are violating violating the law in that way. Yeah, I think that's really interesting to hear. Um, also the kind of lack of enforcement of kind of minimum wage laws that. Lots of care workers, are, you know, um, a huge proportion of the care work is made up of migrant workers. They might not necessarily know what, you know, the minimum wage level is. They might not know how to access the minimum wage or what to do if their employer isn't paying them the wage that they've been advertised and employed to do. So there's a huge amount of issues. Lots of governments, you know, when we spoke about austerity um, earlier, they're cutting away from kind of enforcement bodies that can enforce the minimum wage laws and make sure that care workers are being paid at least the minimum wage. Um, so, you know, just sets out the huge amount of work that unions have to do. Um, so just in the conscious of time, I think we might have to wrap up the Q&A there. But thank you for everyone who submitted questions. Um, and thank you to our panelists um, for joining us, uh, particularly Joe and Megan for joining us from Australia and staying late. Um, it was really great to kind of hear from you. I will now hand over back to Daria. Thank you, Huma, and thanks for the respondents and to the participants for a very engaging and absolutely uh, excellent uh, debate. I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, important issues uh, have been uh, touched upon, uh, and I, I really feel this is uh, a very rich uh, webinar for the issues and the, the challenges ahead uh, for all of us as uh, uh, the labour movement in uh, public services. With that said, we are now uh, getting close to the uh, conclusion of uh, our uh, webinar today. Again, thanks for uh, staying with us and also a note of thanks to our uh, interpreters who kindly are uh, uh, making an extra stretch to enable us to complete the programme today. Uh, so, uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, and give the floor to uh, the Director of International Relations of uh, the KPTU, uh, who is Sung Hee Oh. Uh, she uh, has been absolutely key and is absolutely key in this uh, uh, work. She is very active uh, uh, within the PSI uh, international community and uh, uh, her presence uh, uh, brings uh, a lot of value uh, making known and making it possible to liaise uh, with the wider uh, public service uh, uh, labor community what is happening in in south korea so thanks very much for all the work uh, uh, you put in uh, uh, sanghi uh, to make uh, the launch of uh, this very important policy brief uh, uh, today possible and obviously uh, we will continue to work with you but now the floor is yours uh, for your uh, closing remarks and contextualization from the South Korean perspective uh, of uh, 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 what we've discussed today. I just want to say that Sanghi is not only a, a labor movement a trade unionist and activist but she's also active in uh, women and human rights and she also uh, stands up uh, uh, and, and works as, as an activist against uh, the state uh, violence uh, uh, on human rights uh, and uh, on uh, trade union repression. So over to you Sanghi for your closing remarks. Thank you. So I will be really brief. <laughs> um, so based on the achievement So based on the achievement we have made in past, um, KPT adopted its 2023 work program at its annual Congress in February, 2023. Uh, in the work program, we committed to put our utmost efforts to the struggle for strengthening the publicness of public services and expanding trade union rights for all workers against the market fundamentalism based austerity policy of the Yun Sung Yeol administration during the economic crisis. 
So Yunsongyeol administration has consistently demonstrated its commitment to downsizing and privatizing public services through a series of policy announcements before and after its inauguration in May last year as follows. Uh, first, gradually opening up monopoly sales structure of Korea Electric Power Corporation to the private sector. Second, selling 40% of Incheon International Airport Corporation's share to the private sector. Third, putting forward a plan for private sector initiatives in social services, including health, care, and education. And lastly, promoting competition between public and private enterprises and reducing public sector by consolidation and abolition of public institutions. In response to such policies, I would like to share three major works that KPTU is currently working on. So the first is a campaign for legislation of the Framework Act on prohibition of privatization and remunicipalization of public services, which was moved in the National Assembly on 15th March, 2023. The bill has three parts. The first is prohibit privatization of public services that are essential to people's lives. This includes energy, water, sewage, uh, transport, aviation and airport, education, health and care, social welfare, culture, housing, and the environment. The second is prohibit privatization of public services in disguise. Privatization in disguise includes selling public institutions assets to the private sector, opening markets to the private sector, allowing private investment in the public sectors and outsourcing public services to the private sector. The third one is remunicipalization of public services that have already privatized. This includes reclaiming public services to the public hands that either have been privatized partially or fully or privately, privately led, such as telecommunications, care, energy, and urban metro. As always, both the conservative ruling party and major opposition party are expected to not to support the bill. So there is no guarantee that it will be considered or passed in the National Assembly. But KPTU will continue to work with progressive parties and civil society organizations for the bill to be legislated. The second one is the National March uh, campaign to call on the government to reverse, reverse its plans for public utilities bill hikes in the second half of the year. The Yoon Song Yeol administration, which drastically increased energy bills earlier this year, citing a lack of state finances in the face of actual wage cuts for, uh, for the workers is forecasting further energy bill hikes and public transport fare increases in the second half of the year. The Yoon Song Yeol administration has decided to cut public services in the name of maintaining state finances while granting tax cuts of 60 trillion Korean won for corporations and the wealthy for the next five years. In response, KPTU's National March, cultural festivals, and reach out campaigns are taking place with alliances in major cities across the country from 10th March. In the campaigns, KPTU is calling on the government to reverse its plan for public utilities bill hikes and to take its responsibility for enhancing public services. Finally, KPTU and uh, PPIP have published a book magazine named the future is public last week. Uh, this magazine will be published twice a year. Although we have not formally sued permission from TNI, obviously we borrowed the title from TNI. Um, so this is the uh, actual book. <laughs> Maybe I blur the... Yeah, so this is the book. <laughs> uh, we hope this magazine will present that Element, what the elements for strong public services that our society needs are, 
as well as what our alternatives are against market fundamentalism based policy within the labor movement. The Korean version of the first issue was released last week and the English version will be released in April. So as you can see uh, on the slide, contributors to this first issue include David Hall from PSIRU, Kuma from PSI, Guy Collis from Unison, and Sean Sweeney from Tuit. So I will share a link to the English version through PSI uh, at Origin Network, if possible. And also uh, we'll share uh, the link through uh, KPTU's website and uh, Facebook. So lastly, I hope that KPTU's campaigns to strengthen the publicness of public services can contribute more to the international movement for municipalization of public services. KPTU always stands in solidarity with international unions campaigns and fights for strong and quality public services with universal access. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanghi, for these very important uh, uh, closing remarks, which actually point to uh, the next steps of uh, the KPTU campaign on uh, uh, defending and promoting uh, public services, not only in care, but in all uh, uh, the different realms of the public service provision in the South Korean uh, uh, society. But it also shows very well how the KPTU is engaged in uh, uh, bringing about a, uh, a, a, a societal change in the consciences and in the perception of how citizens and the public opinion and the service users um, can perceive uh, public services in public hands differently. And I think it's, uh, it's very nice that today we brought together South Korea and Australia because Australia obviously has a, a long-standing history of uh, 20 years of uh, privatized services, but the strength and the uh, relentless action of uh, the unions there have also made it possible to bring about uh, a regime, uh, a policy regime change with the election of the Labour government last year, which uh, uh, paves the way to uh, good hopes for insourcing and for uh, a transformative uh, uh, and systemic change of public services. And we hope that despite the fact that South Korea is now uh, facing uh, a very conservative government, which does not uh, hesitate to use uh, uh, the police uh, to raid the uh, offices of uh, our um, trade union uh, comrades, uh, you will stand up uh, to this uh, major challenge and you will win because in the end uh, the uh, reality of uh, uh, public services in public hands and the potential they have to uh, tackle the multiple crises we are all living uh, today, not only climate of course but also inequality um, and, uh, and, and also the lack of access uh, to, to services, inflation is just uh, uh, absolutely overwhelming. So with that, uh, I would just uh, like to thank again uh, all uh, the speakers and, uh, and you as a public for a very interactive session. Before we do that, uh, let me just uh, ask uh, the speakers and panelists uh, to just uh, turn on their video for a moment. We will take uh, a, a screenshot of the panel for uh, an article we would like to publish on uh, the PSI and hopefully KPTU website as well. And uh, uh, from uh, PSI, Huma and I would also like to send you a word of solidarity uh, for South Korean comrades. So just 30 seconds uh, to enable my colleagues to take the picture. Thank you. I take that has been done. So thank you very much. Let me just uh, go uh, about uh, thanking everyone in the, in the right way. Just one, uh, one word on what are the next steps on the PSI work on remunicipalization, as this is a good opportunity. 
First of all, I'd like to inform you uh, of the fact that uh, PSI and EPSU, our European region, have uh, uh, finally uh, found a, a good contractor to uh, advance uh, uh, what uh, uh, we have planned to do in terms of uh, development of an online uh, training for trade unionists and workers on how to deprivatize uh, public uh, services and uh, we count on uh, the KPTU uh, participation in the steering committee of this uh, uh, project that will start uh, uh, shortly, uh, probably as of next month. I've seen colleagues from Unison, I've seen colleagues from uh, uh, the Safe de France, you're all welcome to join uh, us in this uh, uh, important endeavor, which we hope will equip our trade unions with the tools and the collective intelligence we have gathered to continue and uh, uh, advance our deprivatization of public services. I would also like to mention that uh, PSI will soon open, probably at the end of this month, a new uh, issue page uh, on the website dedicated especially to remunicipalization, where you will find all the resources and uh, including extracts uh, of today's uh, um, webinar, uh, especially the presentations. I also want to uh, announce that uh, TNI, the Transnational Institute, and some of our colleagues uh, uh, there were uh, in the webinar today is uh, uh, refurbishing the global deprivatization database, uh, Public Futures, which will be launched uh, uh, in a refurbished uh, uh, format in April. It will also include a much uh, more labor-friendly kind of research engine. We will be able to search uh, cases of deprivatization and remunicipalization uh, through uh, a labor sorting tool uh, so that we will be able to see which cases have involved uh, uh, labor unions. And uh, uh, last but not least, I call on all of you and uh, uh, those in your organizations who uh, work actively on uh, deprivatizing public services to keep in touch with us and to let us know about your campaigns so that we can continue to uh, encourage share, uh, but also fuel this global deprivatization uh, movement that we as the trade unionists in public services are actually leading. And with that said, I would like to thank our speakers, Jae-hun Lee, uh, Dae-hae Oh, uh, Songhae Oh, but of course also Joe Wagner and Megan Corliss for your extremely valuable uh, contributions to the colleagues from uh, South Korea. I would like to say <laughs> in Korean, in my bad Korean. <laughs> and uh, I would also like to thank all the participants uh, uh, who have been very interactive and have added to the discussion. It was a very engaging Q&A session. Thanks for that. Thanks to my colleagues Huma Haq and Tom Reddington, our sub-regional uh, secretary for uh, Oceania, who has really uh, been very helpful uh, liaising with uh, our colleagues uh, um, uh, in, in Australia. Uh, and of course, thanks to our PSI colleagues who are in the back office, but without whom nothing could be possible uh, in terms of uh, uh, E-Virtual uh, Activities, Hazel Ripple, Iraida Escubi in the Zoom back office. I would also like to thank Veronique Lamoureux, who did uh, the in-house design for the brief, and Andrea Oates, who is with us today. She was the editor of uh, uh, the English version of uh, the paper. And of course, last but not least, uh, a very uh, special note of thanks to the interpreters team for providing always a, a high quality um, interpretation and for your patience. Thank you very much and uh, stay well and we will be in touch. Bye.